Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in today's video, we're going to talk about what's new in Fusion for July 2025. Now, like with most of these what's new updates, I'm not going to cover everything. I'm only going to cover the things that I think impact what we do on this channel. And so with that, if you want to find all of what's new, you can always go up to your help menu. There's going to always be a what's new that will take you directly to the blog post. I'll also put a link to it in the description of the video. Uh, so for example, there are updates to things like bill of materials and the save as menu. If you're doing collaborative part numbers, these are all things that don't affect us because they're integrated into manage extension, for example. So I'm not going to cover those. Uh, there have been a change to the home tab. I don't personally use the home tab. I've got it turned off when I load fusion, but they've basically been changing things like the size and scale of these icons. So you can fit more on the page. So if you do happen to use that, that has been a slight update, but in terms of design features that I think impact what we do on this channel, I think that a couple of things have come up in this uh, update that happened today, July 15th, and that's a constraint feature, which is new. We now have this new option called constraint components. In addition to the joints and as built joints, we'll talk about that. Um, insert component is something that has been somewhat around. Uh, it's just now there's a button here on the assemble menu. There's also insert derive that lives over here. Uh, again, I don't typically use these. I, I oftentimes just drag them from the data panel over. Uh, that's one thing that you can't really do from the home tab. And uh, I, unfortunately, that's how I bring files in. So I generally don't use that home tab. Another thing that we're going to cover is changes to auto constrain in 2D sketches. Uh, they've updated the uh, offset command in sketches. And uh, probably the biggest feature that I know a lot of you have looked for and asked for is the ability to add textures. Uh, so there's a mesh texture feature uh, that's in there now. And there's also more additions to configurations. So uh, for example, you can now do on the fly configurations for joints. So those are the main things we're gonna talk about. Again, if you wanna see everything, check out the description of the video or go to your help menu and go to what's new. So first, what is the constraint feature and how does that differ from joints and as-built joints? Well, if you're coming from Inventor or SolidWorks or pretty much any other CAD program, joints is a bit of a foreign concept. Uh, the way that you put together components with degrees of freedom generally is done different in most other CAD programs. Now, Inventor is a unique one because it has constraint, it has joint, and it has... Um, uh, something called mate. There's a little bit of overlap between mate assembly constraints and mates, but basically we are looking at the difference between locking down all degrees of freedom with a single operation with joint or being able to constrain multiple components with multiple steps in a single command. So the approach that you take for it is going to be slightly different. And we're going to walk through both of those joint and constraint component here. So first, how we would do this now with joint is we would pick the component. So for example, the center of this cylindrical pin, we'd pick where we want it to go. And then we would determine the motion that we want. So in this case, if we want it to be rigid, or if we wanted it to revolve, we could have it um, revolve. If we wanted it to move um, up and down while it's revolving, then we have that option. And of course we can do things like drive the limits. So minimum and maximum for rotation and minimum and maximum for uh, the distance. So let's see, let's put a maximum on here and we'll maybe move that up. Uh, so what this allows us to do is move this up and down between a set distance and we can also again, put in some of those values for rotation. Now, the way that constraint differs is what we do is we typically are going to start to define either the position of the objects or an, ang uh, an angular position of the geometry. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the, uh, the cylindrical face of the pin and the cylindrical face of the body it's going to. You'll notice there's a little bit of a gap there. Now, once we have that selected, we're gonna hit the plus icon and then we can add a secondary constraint. So the bottom of this face here to the top of that. And then we can add another constraint if we wish. So for example, if we want to add an angle, uh, we could say maybe uh, this face here and this face here. And then we define the angle. Maybe it needs to be at 30 degrees. And then we'll say, okay. Uh, so now this component is completely locked in place 
by this constraint component feature. We can always go back and we can make changes. We can say, well, maybe we really didn't want to constrain the angle. We'll say, okay. And now once it updates, this can rotate freely, but it can't move up and down because it's constrained in place based on those other two references. So once again, it's a slightly different approach to how we put components together in Fusion. If you've only used Fusion as your CAD program and you've come accustomed to joints, there's really no problem with still using joints. Uh, constraints is just a new way to do things. There are benefits to using constraint components in some instances, especially when you're dealing with putting multiple components together. So for example, if we had three or four different components, we could put them all together in constraint where joint is limited to two components and you're locking all the degrees of freedom down in that one joint. There are going to be some drawbacks. So for example, without joints, we can't use the option to do a motion link. Uh, so, or driving the joints, because that's how we would, that's how we would define motion between, let's say two revolute joints, if we wanted to pretend like there is a belt or a chain on it. Or if you're doing a rack and pin, then you can have, um, you know, have that between the different joints. That doesn't work with constrained components uh, at this point in time. Maybe it will in the future, I don't know. But again, there are benefits to using both of them, just kind of depends on what you're doing. The next thing I wanna talk about is updates to auto constrain. Um, now, this is still a tool that I don't really use. And uh, there are probably some of you out there that do use this tool, but it, it's getting better. It's still not where I would want it to be. And, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, so I've got two examples here. This first example here, auto constrain. What this is going to do is according to Autodesk, this is, you know, AI addition to fusion. Basically it's going through and it's trying to come up with a scenario that it can use to lock down this design. Now I've already provided it with some initial constraints. You can see that I've got a symmetry constraint for these angled lines here and a symmetry constraint here. And you can toggle between multiple results and you can even go through and generate more results. Now, the addition to this functionality here is this new tool bar that's kind of floating around here. It gives us the ability to set the datum on the fly if we want. We also have the ability to select delete and edit dimensions on the fly. So for example, I can double click here and I can say that's supposed to be uh, 10 millimeters and hit enter. Maybe this is supposed to be 15. Uh, this one here is supposed to be seven. There's an angle kind of tucked in here. Let's say that's supposed to be 90. And we can continue on going through and manipulating these dimensions. Uh, let's say this one needs to be 45. That should be 50. And so this was a big problem before because after we use this tool, we would have to go back and still manually edit these dimensions. Now we can do it on the fly, which is pretty handy. The downside that I see here is we don't have the ability to add a dimension while the tool is active. I think that would be really helpful if we could do that because that would give us the ability to fully define the sketch on the fly inside of that auto constraint tool. Uh, so again, it's getting better. It now it gives us the ability to edit those things on the fly. It's just not quite where I see it as beneficial for most of the sketches that I create. The other thing that happened with auto constraint is now it has the ability to do a diameter if you have a center line set. So you can see here the first dimension scheme has diameter values. So we can come in and we can manipulate these just like we could on the first example. Let's say that's supposed to be 45. Maybe that's a hundred, but it has a diameter scheme. So again, this is another updated. It has the ability to identify that center line. One thing that I don't like that has happened with this tool is it automatically minimizes the sketch palette and it doesn't maximize it. It doesn't bring it back after it does that, which is kind of a pain for me. I use the sketch palette quite a bit, but Again, the tool is improving, it's changing, and those are some of the things that have been updated. All right, so next on the list is offset. Uh, so the offset tool in a sketch, and I'll just go ahead and I'll create a new sketch. Uh, basically the offset tool in a sketch has updated. In the past, we weren't really able to do an offset of an offset. 
And now it seems to be working. Uh, so in the past, it did not work. And now we can do an offset of an offset. So in my book, that's a nice improvement. I think offset has gotten uh, attention the last couple of times that Fusion has got an update. So, you know, we can do symmetric or, or two side offsets. Um, this is pretty nice. One thing I would still love to see, and this is something that SolidWorks does, is the ability to make the original selected curve or chain construction automatically. So a checkbox in here or something, because oftentimes if you take a selection like this and you offset it two directions, that original edge is going to be construction. You're not going to use it. So I think that would be really great if we had the ability to toggle that on as construction during the tool. But Again, slight improvement there. We now can do an offset of an offset and I've tested it on a few different shapes, seems to work fine. And uh, in the past, it just didn't work. It did not like that. So I think that's a good update to have, even if it is quite minor. I think that uh, if you use the offset tool enough, that can be a big time saver. Okay, so while we're on this model here, one other thing that I do wanna talk about is configurations. Now we've done a couple videos in a small series on configurations on the channel and configurations on the fly is one of the big things that gets talked about. So several tools have been added to configurations on the fly. And what I mean by that is in the dialog boxes, you can see we've got for joint position and motion. Now, if you create a configuration, if you start configuring a design and you go into the joint tool, you'll now see a configure tab. So this is gonna be based uh, very much on what you have inside of your design. So you will need to have configurations active and you will need to you know, explore which tools have this functionality, but each time Fusion gets an update, they seem to be adding more and more tools. So things like Extrude have been on it for a while. In the last update, they started uh, adding surface tools, have uh, the configure tab here. And again, it's gonna be very much dependent on the way you configure the feature you're using. So uh, for example, if we extrude a surface from here, we have got the configure option to, uh, to do the distance and the taper angle and uh, taper angle and we say, okay. And if we bring up this dialog box, you can see here that we now have the ability to configure those distances and maybe do say a one degree taper. Now, when we go back and forth between those two different configurations, uh, it'll automatically capture that configuration data. So again, if you use configurations, that's a nice addition. You can now, uh, you can now use configure joints on the fly. The last big enhancement that I wanna talk about is the addition of mesh texture. Uh, so this is a cool tool. I think that it's got a lot of promise, but there are still some drawbacks that I wanna talk about. Uh, so first, let's just take a look at how it works. I'm gonna use this example here, and we're gonna go to modify and texture extrude. I'm gonna select an image. So I've got a couple images to show here. So this is just black and white lines. I'm gonna go ahead and scale this up. I'm gonna rotate this around so we can kind of see what's going on. So we've got black lines and white lines, depending on your extrude setting. If it's symmetric, then the black and the white will go up and down the same amount. White will go up by default, black will go down into the mesh body by default. If you set it at asymmetric, it will bring up the black and white independently. So we can make black go positive, white go zero or negative. You can turn on the preview. And essentially what's gonna happen here is it'll take this black and white image and it will raise the areas you want or depress or lower the areas uh, you want. So for example, if I set black at zero and I set white, it's gonna have to redo the preview. I set white at one. Uh, so then what it's gonna do is black will stay on the exact surface and now white will raise up. You can use negative values in here as well. If I put negative one for white, it will push those down into the mesh. And there are some other uh, options in here. So things like blend. Uh, so you can see here, these are kind of tapering down. That blend distance is dictating that taper. But again, the limitation here is we really need a pretty high density mesh to make this work, even with this simple example of line. So I'm gonna say, okay. And the end result is gonna be a modified mesh. So now you can see we've got this this texture here. So if you're going to 3D print this, this would be perfectly fine. Let's go ahead and look at another example. I'm going to select over here, 
go to modify texture extrude. And one thing I tried to do, I was trying to get it to work with something like a topographic map. Uh, so let's just say something like this. Again, I'm going to have to scale the image up. And then we'll go ahead and preview this. So once again, right now, all the white areas are going to push down and all the black areas are staying level. But if I set the uh, black ones to come up a millimeter, anywhere there is a black line will be raised up. Now, this example didn't quite work how I wanted it to. I'm going to set the blend value to zero. But you can kind of see what you can do depending on the images that you have available. Now, it seems to work quite a bit better with clean black and white images. So if you have just a simple texture, like if you are dealing with, again, lines like we had there, or if you're dealing with some sort of standard pattern, let's see, I've got another sample image that I, uh, I put together here that was just a bunch of uh, black circles or dots. So if you've got these very clean lines between them, then this works pretty well. Uh, it has the ability to, again, raise or lower based on these settings. I'm going to go ahead and do a uh, larger blend distance and allow it to create that. So where do I think that this would be useful inside of Fusion? Well, that's kind of a tough one. If you are using Fusion as your 3D print slicer, this can be a nice option. Uh, most of the time, 3D print slicers, several of them already have texture features available. So I can't really see a good use case for doing this in Fusion. And the main reason for that is because if you're creating a basic body, uh, let's just do, I'll do a box to show this as an example. So if you're creating a basic body and you want to apply a texture to it, First, what we need to do is tessellate that. And then we need to take that and we'll need to remesh it. Uh, so I'm gonna remesh the entire thing to create some triangles. And the really the only way that this texture works is if you've got a really high density triangle count. So you need to continue to, to sort of continue to remesh this. Um, and if you're wondering about the face colors, this is an, just an easier way to make a selection. Doing generate face groups and under inspect display mesh face groups. So that is a nice way that you can just select everything up to a sharp corner or up to an angle between the triangles. So again, continue to remesh it until I have a high density. Then we need to go into direct edit. And then from here, we can go to face group, select a face that we want to use, and then you can use texture extrude. So once again, it, there's a couple of extra steps that you have to use. It is nice to have the ability to do this directly in Fusion. I am still failing to see a great use case for it though. So that's going to be it for the main updates for July 2025. As I mentioned, there are plenty of other updates, things like new sketch symbols and drawings, uh, some improvements to things like auto scale and tidy up in drawings, changes to manufacturing and PCB. And there are some uh, sort of uh, graphic changes depending on different backgrounds and environments that you're using. So there are plenty of different changes, but again, I generally will cover the things that I think impact us on a day-to-day -day basis for the design tools that we use. So if you have any questions on this or any of the other updates, then please leave a comment on this video. And if you have any questions at all, leave those comments as well. And as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.